But I'm going to talk briefly about two things. What do we know about how this disease is transmitted and how to protect ourselves? Um, okay. Basically, that's that. So anyway, so for a disease like this, that the virus is present in saliva and respiratory fluid, you basically uh, can get infected when that uh, fluid that has a virus leaves the person and reaches the other person. So for example, through a surface, you know, the virus is on this phone and this person touches the inside of the eyes, nostrils or mouth, or through little balls of saliva respiratory fluid that fly through the air. And they come in two sizes, big and small. The big ones are the drops or droplets. They behave like a projectile and they can hit you again inside the eye, the nostrils, the mouth and you can get infected that way. And that's what we've been told most of the pandemic is the dominant mode of transmission. And then at the same time that a drop may come out, you have a thousand much smaller aerosols that also come out and that float in the air more like cigarette smoke. And the, aer the aerosols infect us by inhaling them. Okay. Um, so now what, what um, uh, did WHO tell us, for example, at the beginning? Well, they had this video in which they had these projectiles again flying from one person to another and that person got infected. Now they said distance helps to reduce infection, which is an empirical observation. The fact that distance reduces infection is empirical. But they said our interpretation is because if you have distance, then the droplets fall here and then this person is completely safe. And, um, and they told us, you know, in the, uh, over a year and a half ago, that basically they were certain that this disease was not being breathed in, wasn't going through the air, it was going through these droplets when people cough and, and that they were too heavy to stay in the air and they fall to the ground. And maybe it, it was also going through surfaces. And they were so certain of this that they said to call, to say that it goes through the air is misinformation. Okay. So they were so sure. Now, this is one of the biggest errors in the entire history of public health, because later on the evidence has been accumulating and it's now overwhelming. This article is from February of 2021, in which basically with, with colleagues, um, we summarize a lot of the evidence that had accumulated by them. Now we have a lot more. And in the paper at the end, we conclude, although other routes maybe can contribute and we were being generous, we believe the airborne route is likely to be dominant. So basically we're breathing this virus in through aerosols. Okay. And this has had a lot of impact. And um, uh, well, I'll, I'll say briefly, um, kind of, uh, I'll, I'll give one example of the evidence that makes us conclude this. This will take a much longer talk. So for example, probably the clearest evidence is that transmission outdoors is much less than indoors. And this is one example from Japan, but there are many papers that show this. And in Japan, they followed 22 people who had, um, who later found they were infected, but they had met with people indoors before they knew they were infected and 88 who had met outdoors. And you see that the people who met indoors infected people more often than not and infected large numbers of people often, while outdoors it was the opposite. Now, if this was, you are talking to someone and these droplets fall to the ground, they fall to the ground, gravity is the same indoor and outdoors, and it should be very similar. The fact that it is really 20 times less likely to get infected outdoors, it's really telling us that this is a dominantly airborne disease. Okay. And there are many other pieces of, of evidence like super spreading event, like the choir we studied, um, but I, I don't have time to, to go into it. But even to this day, many public health agencies talk in the following way. When you are nearby, you get infected at these droplets that fall to the ground. And then when you are far away, you can get infected by these aerosols. And this is unphysical. You know, a lot of, what's become clear, a lot of public health organizations don't have much understanding of physics. Because for this to happen, this needs to be the case. You know, if these aerosols can be infective in a room and lead to a super spreading event with time, then definitely um, they were much more concentrated in close proximity. So this explains the two uh, main forms of, of transmission. Here you're breathing the aerosols in close proximity. Here you're breathing them in, in a poorly ventilated room. Eventually WHO has accepted this. So the 30th of April, because it was embarrassing not to accept it and CDC and other authorities have accepted it. But really they put it on their website. They don't make any announcement and they don't really radically change the message or the measures. Okay. Now, we, we more recently published that uh, this is true also for the flu, not just for, um, 
and really for most respiratory viruses. And this had, the evidence was already in the literature, but the same resistance that we encountered with COVID had led to this uh, misinterpretation. Yeah. So why there is such resistance? So again, this, this, this will be a long topic, but uh, my hypothesis based on, on a lot of discussions is uh, history plays a major role. There was a misunderstanding, an error from a hundred years ago that uh, you know, a public health, prominent public health researcher said that droplets are, are dominant and aerosols are, are almost impossible. And this became a dogma until now, until the pandemic. And, and everyone who is in control in the public health organizations basically um, comes from this paradigm. Then there was a complete asymmetry of power because of this history. WHO forms a committee to decide how the disease is transmitted and they invite six experts in hand washing and zero experts in airborne transmission for a new disease that we don't know how it's transmitted, but it sounded like they already thought they knew how it was transmitted. They also mentioned there were limited resources in some countries, things like masks and whatever. Once it has become clear uh, that the disease is airborne, not losing face by WHO and other organizations and prominent researchers has become an important motivation. And finally, I think there is, there is one other one that uh, one other reason that, that explains why especially the measures don't, don't change, even though they accept that it goes through the air. And it's because droplets and surfaces are more convenient for governments and for organizations and companies. Because if you get infected, well, you didn't wash your hands, you didn't keep your distance, you didn't wear your mask well, it's, the responsibility is mostly yours. Well, if you get infected, um, but it's, it was airborne, then you know your employer, your government didn't provide you with good ventilation. And they really have a horror of that. You know, If, if they mention ventilation, it's all kind of very voluntary and they don't want um, any of that. So very briefly, I'll, I'll say a few things about how to protect ourselves against, against transmission. We have these frequently asked questions that we put together with many scientists out of desperation. I'll put the link on the chat. Out of desperation, the WHO, CDC, and others were just not giving the right message. Um, the most important thing is to communicate, you know, that, that really this is like cigarette smoke, it fills the room, and that's how we get infected. And things like plexiglass barriers, they work when you're kind of in a cashier situation, but otherwise they actually hurt. There is a study where it show, it's shown that they double transmission, which again is evidence of aerosols and, and no droplets. We have to stop wasting time on disinfecting surfaces. It doesn't do anything, um, doesn't serve any purpose, it's, it's toxic, and um, but it still is, is the dominant mode of prevention in many places. We have to do things outdoors whenever possible. This is a school uh, doing uh, outdoor schooling in New York in 1910 during a tuberculosis epidemic. And in many places, many times things can be done outdoors. And, take advantage of the most effective measure of the pandemic, which is the much reduced outdoor transmission. Uh, masks are important, but what hasn't been communicated is a mask is no longer a parapet to stop these droplet projectiles, but it is a filter. The air we breathe, we inhale and exhale has to go through the filter. And if you have little gaps, like here you see this video and it's common, for example, with surgical masks, through a gap that's one or two percent of the area of the mask, so a gap that's very small, goes 50 percent of the air we breathe. You know, so the mask that you normally see in society, you know, any mask is better than no mask. But really, if people, if we just communicate to people, please spend time in the mirror or with your wife or with your friends, making sure your mask fits well and that you wear the one that fits the best. This is low-hanging fruit that hasn't really been um, taken advantage of. Um, there is a lot of stuff that's, that's being sold for air cleaning. You know, if the virus is in the air, you wanna remove it. The first thing is to uh, ventilate. So you open the window or in some way you get that air that has the virus away, that's the best. Or if you cannot remove the air, then you remove the virus and keep the air, that's filtration. And there is commercial HEPA filters that are more expensive or uh, systems that you can build with a fan like these Corsi Ros Rosenthal boxes that are much cheaper and work very well. Um, what we should avoid in our opinion of many scientists is we, we keep the air, we keep the virus in the air, but we try to kill the virus that's floating in the air, a kind of disinfection. There is one, one type of disinfection, which is with ultraviolet light that works and, and uh, doesn't seem to have too many, um, too many problems, but there is many techniques 
where people are basically spraying disinfectants like bleach, ozone, hydrogen peroxide, alcohol, or electronic air cleaners, ions, plasmas, hydroxyls, photocatalysis, all of these is dangerous in our opinion, because uh, whatever hurts the biomolecules of the virus hurts our respiratory system, our eyes, and it also produces indoor, with indoor contaminants, it produces more dangerous um, contaminants. So we should avoid all of those things. And now let's skip this for time. So then the last thing I wanted to mention is measuring CO2 is something that can be done for very low cost and is very useful because the virus kind of fills the room, the aerosols that contain the virus, and so does the CO2 that we exhale. The virus has been exhaled by someone and the CO2 that gets trapped indoors, which is where, um, uh, where transmission is happening. You know, and you cannot measure the virus, but you can measure CO2 with, with meters such as this one that costs from about $100. The ones that use infrared technology are the ones that work. And what we've been saying now for over a year is that basically everywhere where we share the air, any you know, bar, school, gym, whatever, we should have a, a publicly viewable CO2 meter because basically that tells us if the place is well ventilated or not. And, it is, and people really, for example, in the schools, this has been done a lot and people spring into action if the CO2 gets high and they open the windows or they figure out what they have to do to make the conditions safer. And that's all I had. Thanks for, thanks for the invitation to speak and I'll be happy to discuss anything.